Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Kenyan Shen, Associate Professor and Extension Specialist at West Virginia University, Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, I'm living in Pittsburgh. I'm about like nine hours from Montreal, and it's my honor to give you a, a presentation, share some of, of the information with you about the overview of bacteria for the safety in the United States, and talk a little bit about our research extension activities. So first of all, uh, give you an overview of the football illness in the United States. We have two surveys showed up here. The first one is a little bit old. That's back 20 years ago. The illness per year in the United States is 75 million. Hospitalization more than 300,000, cause 5,200 5, deaths. The cost 8.4 billion. So we compare the new data, not really new, it's about 10 years old and new. We will find that in 2011, the, the illness per year is significantly decreased to 7, 48 million. Hospitalization decreased more than 60% to 180,000. And this 3,000, but cost because of the medical cost increased. So the cost is actually increased almost tenfold to 77.7 7 billion. So what are the pathogens really cause a problem in the United States? Well, there is so many. And basically we talk about norovirus, Capillobacter salmonella, E. coli 157H7, non O157, Shigate toxin generated E. coli, Listeria mollusatogenes, Clostridium, Shigella toxoplasma, and some of the emerging organisms. Now, we've done the research a lot regarding the bacteria foodborne pathogens. And here, related to the regulation for the extension activity, we will be I will be giving you some introduction for the E. coli and the Listeria because uh, for the others you can learn in the, you will learn in the other classes. Uh, I believe like the Capillobacter Salmonella. I believe Dr. Ruth's lab has been doing tremendous work and published maybe more than a hundred papers in that area. So we will skip talk. I'm skip talking about those right now. But then I will be focused on all of the extension and the research activity and give some introduction about the pathogens, about some pathogens. So this table, which it tells you, the top five pathogens cause domestic acquired foodborne illness. So what are the top five? So we just mentioned the number one is norovirus actually. It's not a bacteria, it's a virus. Followed by, followed by salmonella, then clostridium perfringens, capillobacter and the staphylococcus aureus. Then this is more important. What are we gonna cause the hospitalizations? The top five pathogen cause Hospitalization, number one, salmonella, a non typhoid. You should know the difference between typhoid salmonella. We just talk about the typhoid Mary and the salmonella non typhoid. We are talking about uh, the other species. And the norovirus, Capillobacter, Toxoplasma gondii, and, and the E. coli. So the percentage range from 35 to 4. Now, which one actually will cause death? Number one is salmonella. Then very surprisingly followed by Toxoplasma gondii, then Listeria, norovirus, and the Capillobacter. The percentage of, uh, range from 28 to 6%. Now we gave you a little bit of introduction here. What is the foodborne pathogen concerns? So in the fresh meat, if we talk about uh, poultry meat, really we concern about salmonella Capillobacter. And the United States the Department of Agriculture for the Safety Inspection Service do have a regulation we, call, we talk about carcass performance standards for salmonella and the capillobacter. So salmonella has to be below 7.5 percentage of positive and the capillobacter has to be no larger than 10.4. But be careful as both of those are not zero tolerance on poultry meats. But in other words, there's a little bit difference. E. coli 0157H7 and non 0157 Shigate toxin E. coli, those are zero tolerance for the fresh meat and including ground meat 
and the nine tagged meat. Now for ready to eat meat, poultry, turkey breast, ham, frankfurters, hot dogs, we really care about the easily sterile monosatogenous. Uh, the pasture will grow in the refrigerator temperature, cause lots of the problem. Now for fruits and the vegetables, it's kind of a broad base. All the bacteria will be, have a concern. Major, major salmonella, E. coli, norovirus. But recent 10 years, people really care about Listeria monosatogenous. So we talk a little bit about Listeria. Listeria has six species. Now the number one we talk about is monosatogenous. Uh, we will have some slides later on talk about detail. Followed by Listeria inoka. Inoka most of the time is a surrogate as a Listeria monosatogenous. So the surrogate usually means during the process control, the behave has to be equal or better than the Listeria monosatogenous. Then they can use the implant validation studies. Now the other four species we barely heard about in the lab because in, some of them just coming from the soil, they're so not really, really pay much attention regarding the food safety. Now, what is Listeria monosatogenous? You know that everybody probably know it's gram positive. It's a Petrochecus flagella, which means the flagella cover the surface so they can have a very strong movement. We call it a motility ability. And it's a facultative anaerobic, which means it's grow uh, in both with or without oxygen, but grow better with oxygen. And it's have a hemolysing positive, which means it co could be caused lysing of the blood cell, possibly cause better hemolytic, which is tr completely transparent zone surrounding the colony on the blood agar. Now, what we really care about here, a serotyping in the United States, there is a certain serotypings. And the 95% of the foodborne illness, foodborne listeriosis is due to the serotype uh, 0.5a, 0.5b, and the 4b, those three species. Now, in the North America, the cerebral 4b, which is accounts for 65 to 80 percent of listeria monosatogenous strains. Now, we just mentioned about uh, listeria monosatogenous, so we will talk a little bit about their characteristics. This pet bacteria is a mesophiles, so it can grow very well at BHI, TSB, TSBYE at 37 degrees Celsius. Now, sometimes we add B vitamin amino acid to let it grow dramatically. This can be survived in 10% salt, so it's a halophile. And a very wide pH range, 4.1 to 9.6, from weak to a little bit strong alkaline environment, weak acid to a little bit strong alkali environments. Now remember that 10% salt is very important because lots of the frankfurters, hot dogs, daily meats, their salt is higher, is at least five to 10%. They can survive there. That's one of the reasons they can survive very well on the ready to eat meat. And also you should know salt is one of the natural preservatives for pathogen in the long time for the history of the food processing in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, for the microbiology area. And they can be grow very well in the refrigerator temperature, 0.5, 3.0 degrees Celsius. And they can be also grow on a very wide range of the water activity value, can be as low as 0 0.9. So that is the water activity value usually for salami and the summer sausage, Hot dog usually is higher 0 0.99, 0 0.998. So you can see most of the, of the ready to eat meat, the environments which is really favorable, or at least the Listeria monosatogenous can survive there. Now, it caused a major problem in the United States, which is we can say from 1998 to 2002, there is a multi states outbreaks caused more than $5 million lost. And you can see that overall, they cause about 30, uh, they cause about 35 deaths and almost 200 cases in the United States. And it will cause stillbirths, miscarriage, those are a big deal. And uh, in, totally involved is about like 40 states. Because of this outbreak, from 1998 to 2002, so start from 2003, 
there is a uh, three alternatives established by USDA FSIS to well control Listeria mrosatogenes on ready to eat meat during ready to eat meat processing. So including post lethality treatment with antimicrobials. Post lethality treatment, which means you can use like a, a cooking is one of them. And the sorophily co cooking to the internal temperature more than 170 degrees Fahrenheit. You can add in antimicrobials like lactic acid, citric acid, potassium lactate. Or you can use choose one of them, post lethality treatment, or use antimicrobials. And the antimicrobials could be as an ingredient or spray on the surface or using a dipping treatment. If you don't want to do anything, that's okay. You can do a good job of sanitation. However, that requires very frequent microbial testing. Uh, we, you learn in the other classes, there's class two, class three microbial testing standards to uh, belonging to that. So that three alternatives really helps a lot, but if you look at this new survey from 2011, Listeria monocytogenes, they still cause more than 1,600 affordable illness, 1,500 hospitalization, and 260 deaths in the United States annually. So it's still a severe problem. And you learned about that right now, it's actually expanded to go to the fresh produce. Now we talk a little bit about the E. coli. Now you should know most of the E. coli are non-pathogenic. It's like a normal bacteria in our surface on the floor. But they do have a full group, which is a pathogenic E. coli, including ETEC, enterotoxigenic, EPEC, enteropathogenic, EIEC, enteroinvasive, and the enterohomorrhagic E. coli, EHEC. So when we talk about the E. coli O157H7, that is EHEC, enterohemorrhagic. Now, E. coli has a O157H7 has a long history. Back in 1982 in Oregon and Michigan, the ground beef there is outbreaks. But people doesn't really care about that at that time. And I'll tell you why later on it become a big problem. So What's the problem for the pathogenic E. coli? Well, cause bloody diarrhea, abdomen cramping. That's pretty normal for all the foodborne pathogens, but very typical for E. coli O157H7, it will cause uremic, hemorrhagic uremic syndrome, which is called HUS. Uh, usually it's a kidney infection in a children and the elderly people. That will cause 5% lacerative rate. And uh, um, you said so there's a TTP, we call it, uh, we call it adult HUS, which means it's beyond the kidney. The more severe will cause death and also the paralysis of the whole body. Now, why HUS is, is causing by? So we, I wrote here, but the more important you should know there is a two, there's a major toxin caused uh, coming from the E. coli 157H7 is Shigay toxin. We have Shigay toxin 1 and the Shigay toxin 2. Shigay toxin 2 is particularly important for causing hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is blood kidney with water diarrhea. They have two subunits, which is AB toxin. Uh, we learned a lot in the microbiology class talking about AB toxin. A is a toxin domain, B is a transmembrane domain caused blooding. Now, why it is so specific for the kidney? Because in the kidney, there is a very special places could be attached, recognized by the Shigay toxin. The acronym is GB3, full name is glycolipid global trial acid remide. It's a higher concentration on the certain organs like kidney. So they attach to that, the toxin released by endocytosis and the A subunit is activated. So that's why the, re that's why the reason, um, that's why the reason the Shagay toxin will cause HUS because they have the target the GB3 on the kidney. I just mentioned, I said nobody cares about the outbreak back in 1982 because it doesn't care, cause main major problem, but this is really bad. This is 1993 in Seattle, Jack in Box. The E. coli 0157H7 outbreak in Hamburg and the results is really bad cause four kids died. They are very young, somewhere between two to six years old. So this story is talking about, we call it Hamburg Q kids. 
Okay, 171 people had hospitalized. Major victims under 10 years old. 45 infected children required hospitalization. 238 have kidney problems, four kids died. Because of this, people recognize E. coli 0157H7. They started to do rapid testing. They started to talk about prevention activities. They started to think about from the federal regulations to the state regulations, what they should do for the 0157H7 regarding all the microbial passages. So right now we know USDA, FSIF, they have a guidelines. Remember, this is only a guideline, not really a regulation. How will be cooking to destroy E. coli 0157H7? You have to be roughly cooking a meat to the internal temperature, actually more than 71.1 degrees Celsius to kill E. coli 0157H7. Make sure this is the internal geometrical temperature is not the temperature on the surface, is not the temperature for setting up the grills. That's important number, 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 70. 1.1 degrees Celsius. Here is the deal. Because of this outbreak in 1993, in 1994, White House at that time, President Clinton started to pay much attention to this. They tried to introduce HACCP. That's a story. Where is the HACCP really comes from? It comes from that big outbreaks for E. coli 0157H7. So we talk a little bit about HACCP. Now, what is a HACCP? Foodborne pathogen, when we want to make sure food safety, most of the time we say we do testing. Okay, we do a lot of testing, but you know that because of the matrix of the food products, testing does not mean food safety. You cannot guarantee all of the surface has been covered. Although we have a class two, class three um, testing standards, it does not mean it will be guaranteed safety. So they started to put these proactive actions now, back in late 1950s, they tried to go to the space. They need to be make sure absolutely the food is safe in the space. So Fisberry, the Natick Army Laboratory in the NASA, they started to develop HACCP to ensure safe food for space flight. So HACCP is a concept coming from later 1950, about 60 years already. Now, HACCP, is a method, methodical and systematic application of appropriate science and plan control document handling and the preparation of the foods. Um, they are talking about risk management and prevention. It should be applied to all phases of food production from farm to the table, but most of the time is post harvest. Um, like I said, this is a, this concept is really is about proactive actions, not really guaranteed for the safety. Although some people will put on the label say their food has been HACCP certified, but does not really mean anything. Just means their plants maybe HACCP certified for their processing. So HACCP we're really talking about is two major things. Number one is critical control point. Well, there's the seven principles we talk about later. But major important number one is critical control points. That is a step during the food processing, which is a, a hazard could be reduced to an acceptable level by the food regulations. And that point could be anything from the raw material to the finished products. Now areas of the concern, basically we really concern biological, chemical and the physical hazards. So physical hazards usually heavy metal, biological, pathogens, viruses, and the chemical sometimes is toxins. <clears throat> now, the HACCP, I mentioned about that story, the, the, the hamburger kills kids, kill the kids. So they start to work in the White House at that time, start to working. They introduced the HACCP in 1996. The Department of Agriculture and the Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, required meat and the poultry processors needs to be developed the HACCP plan. And they published a very heavy, a 300 page document called the Pasture Reduction and the Hazard System. Now at that document, the Pasture Reduction really talk about is actually salmonella reduction. 
And they also introduce you bio, use bio type one generic E. coli as a standard to monitoring the food processing, the safety, con the, the safety control, um, the passion con control. And then they talk details about definition of hazard analysis and, and the critical control points. Uh, start from 1996, it's required all the large esta uh, establishments, manufacturers has need to establish HACCP. Now start from 1999, they say there's a medium size they start to do and the small, very small establishments um, requirements is until 2000 or even 2002. So they should have a HACCP plan. Now right now, all of the HACCP plan, they must be established for the meat and the poultry processor. Now in 1995 and 2001, FDA, now there is something I wanna mention, USDA FSIS responsible for meat, poultry and raw egg and FDA is for the others. So seafood and the juice products, FDA has been introduced a HACCP starts from 1995 to 2001. But be very careful. We talk about the fresh produce, fresh produce has no HACCP plan. So that's a kind of ironic story that's why we talk more about Food Safety Modernization Act for the fresh produce. Um, so Food Safety Modernization Act, that is another one, which is 2015, very new. This talk about the preventive controls for the human foods. That is require regulation uh, food safety plans for all food FDA regulated facilities. And uh, that one is one part of the five components of that. Fresh produce safety is one of them. Okay, we'll mention that later on. So what are the uh, seven principles of HACCP? So first of all, conduct a hazard analysis. You need to figure out biological, chemical, and the physical hazards. Second, during the processing, you need to determine the critical control points. That the critical control points could be to reduce the hazards to an acceptable level. For example, cooking, the internal temperature is a critical control points. Okay, and then critical control points, the cooking processing is a critical control points. Now you have to establish the critical limits that will be a parameters to meet the CCP. Now the critical limits, it's very important. That cannot be arranged. That has to be a fixed number. So let's say the cooking, you have to say, you have to cook to the internal temperature, 160 degree Fahrenheit. That is a critical control critical limits. You can say, oh, we're gonna cook him between 160 to 170 degree Fahrenheit. That is not correct. And each of the critical control points, critical limits, we have to monitor how we do it. So we have to establish monitoring procedures. Anything wrong happened, we have to establish critical uh, corrective actions, take it immediately. So I'll give you an example, if you have the food, uh, which is, has been ground beef in the refrigerator temperature, four degrees Celsius. One day the refrigerator temperature of the cooler, you see it's five degrees Celsius, or it's seven degrees Celsius. The, the, the cooler is broken, what you should do? Those meat, you cannot be take them into the market. You have to, usually they do, they fully cook to ready to eat meat. So those cut type of the corrective actions you have to take in. Then you have to do verification procedures. That's the encoding. Uh, most of the time is a house in house verification. Make sure the critical control points is working, critical limits is, is, is meet the requirements. Then everything you have to keep a uh, record keeping documentation. And that is for the validation, which is usually done by the third party. So that's the seven principles. And then right here, you can see that's a federal reg register, 300 pages, very long. And the, the documents published in 1996 by USDA, uh, which is talk about the pasture reduction and the HACCP system. So that's a major documents. So we talk about the meat safety. We want to talk about the fresh produce safety. So here's the thing, before 2006, when, before this major outbreak happens, everybody think fresh produce safety is safe. So you will see Dr. Larry Bichand published a paper in 1998. The paper talking about the chlorine decontamination E. coli on three different fresh produce products has been cited more than 1,000 times because not many research done at, at, at that time. But this one really keeps people back to the safety of the fresh produce. 
That is happened in 2006 in Salinas Central Valley of California. 200 person, almost 200 person, 26 states, 51% hospitalization, which is E. coli has been contaminated with uh, letters, uh, oh, sorry, with fresh spinach. And uh, this is caused a major problem for those central various fresh produce industry and the Taylor Farms, Fresh Express, or in that area, that is contribute to 90% of the United States fresh, produ fresh produce. And that's the first time the FDA and the produce industry have to sit down and talk about what they should do later on. Because of this outbreak, the tremendous amount of the fresh produce safety has been studied to do in the United States, typically by Un University of California at Davis, we call it UC Davis, and the University of Georgia has been started to do, do tremendous amount of the work. But more important, this guy, this one, this outbreak really, pay, really put people in a front line, needs to be paid much attention to the fresh produce safety. This is in 2012. Uh, 2012 January in Colorado, the Jason Farms has a listeria monosatogenase linked to the cantaloupes. And the total 147 person has been infected, uh, involved 28 states and 33 person people related to outbreak associated deaths. It's a major issue. Now, the story at that time is the Jason Farms has been passed by the uh, good, agri good agriculture uh, practices and the manufacturing practice by a third party was 95% grade, which is A plus grade at that moment. But ironically, when they done that um, validation in inspection and later on, like just a couple of days, they have this major outbreak happens. Now, people do the further follow up, just find that they did a poor job of the sanitation. So, like we mentioned, the listeria mosotarget is for fresh produce. There's no way to do. You cannot, we do a lot of research for antimicrobials, but not really, not really have anything very effective. You cause like one to two log reduction. And this guy really, this pathogen really causes a problem is uh, you have to do lots of good sanitation procedures. That's important. Okay, because of this outbreak, we have a new standards comes out, which is called the Food Safety Modernization Act. There are seven major rules. Uh, some of them re relate to the food imports or exports or imports from foreign countries. But major we really care about, the number one is the produce safety. That standards for growing, harvesting, packing, and the holding of produce for human consumption, and the very similar to the HACCP, which is preventive controls. And I will mention this a little bit. Uh, it's a, called a current good manufacturing practice. And the good manufacturing practice usually we call, talk about is the prerequisite programs for the HACCP. And then we talk about the HACCP, hazard analysis, risk-based preventive controls for human food. They, uh, FISMA signed by the law January 4th, 2011 by President Obama. Um, and when he signed that law at that moment, actually not really people pay much attention to it, but because of this outbreak after 2012, all of the extension service in the United States, they started working the, to study and the study by themselves for the FISMA and then they do a extension training, all kinds of work and the presentations talk about the FISMA, to especially training the small growers. Okay, so what is really, so what is really about risk-based preventive controls? Now, the FISMA requires facilities to develop and implement preventive controls, which constitute their food safety plans. So based on the HACCP concept, they are focused on most of the food safety, preventive, but not reactive. They are going to be have working closely with good manufacturing pra practices. And they try to minimize the risk of food safety hazards. Now, when I go over these, go over these and I attend the training myself, I want to tell you one thing. Um, there is some of the arguments of the industry. They may think about uh, a uh, little bit of fragilism, uh, quotation mark fragilism, which is uh, has up actually this FISMA, which is a risk-based preventive control, copied a lot from HACCP. Okay, so you see there is a CCP. There is a sanitation prevention controls, kind of similar to the sanitation 
standard sanitation procedures and the supply chain preventive controls and the recall plan, very similar. But what is the major thing here is allergy preventive controls. This is something new. So when allergies can be considered for potential hazard through the inadvertent ad addition or mislabeling. So uh, peanut butters, fish, uh, beans, uh, lots of the allergen is something you cannot even imagine it. It's been listed as an allergen. They think allergen, uh, allergen is one of the potential hazards. This is really new for this document. Now, for each of the preventive controls that's identified, you should also have a documentation, critical limits, control points, monitoring, corrective actions, verification, or record peaking, record keeping. Like I said, they're very similar. Now, they also care about the three level of the hazards, biological, chemical, and the physical. Okay, but in the chemicals, they add the allergens, which is not really pay much attention during the hazard plan, but they pay much attention right here. Okay, so now finally, we're gonna talk about the food safety plan. That is a set of the written documents is based on the food safety principles. So we talk about the hazard analysis, preventive controls, recall plan, and you should know there's just three level of the recall. Let's say pathogens, that is a class one, and uh, an allergy, that's allergy, it's a class two, class three, usually it's a mislabel. Okay, and then the delineates the procedures to be followed or monitoring corrective actions and verification. And the food safety system encoding the implication of the food safety plan with GMP SOP. Those we call it a prerequisite programs. So here you basically, you can see it's covered a lot, but the more important is allergen control what they do. But how we control the allergen, uh, the very easy way to do, if you use an allergen during the food processing, you have to use a color laboring in a, di in a different area. Then you know which allergen you has been added. And uh, um, they are still debating, the research is going, what's the minimum concentration they can use, okay? And the very good training opportunity is at extension service for Pennsylvania State University. And I always talk to my students if they are interested to work in future in their industry, in the food industry, and they need to get those training when they were students, especially in the master or PhD period of time. So Pennsylvania State University the extension is a good program. Uh, my university usually is focused for the local very small processors. So some of them not even covered by the FISMA. Okay, so we usually recommend them go PSU to do some of the training. Now, be careful. This is why in our state, uh, we have to be a little bit concerned about the FISMA because FISMA, the food safety standards, they really give flexible for small farmers. If three year average sale more than less than 500,000 and distributed within state or within 275 miles, let's say from Charleston, West Virginia to Morgantown, West Virginia, you don't have to be follow this FISMA regulations. And also the major distribution and the users directly to consumers, restaurants or retail food that you don't have to really follow. So they give flexible for small farmers. And most of the small farms in West Virginia, they are below 500,000 annual average, three average sales, definitely below that. So what they should do. Now we had another thing come out, which is called, it's not really new. It's been there for more than 20, 30 years called the Good Agriculture Practice. It's called GAP. It's a comprehensive system for reducing foodborne illness spread primary by microbes. It is a quality assurance. So it's covered from before planting, during production, during harvesting and post harvesting. All the way we can say from farm to the table. This is their documents. Guideline to minimize microbial food safety hazards for fresh fruits and vegetables published by FDA. Uh, 1998, this is a guideline for the gap for the uh, produce industry. Okay, they try to minimize microbial food safety for fresh produce and the vegetables processors. Major in the United States is in the Central Valley of California and the Arizona Yuma area and the Florida. Okay, so those are the three big states of the fresh produce. Now, what the gap really talking about? We say it's covered from crop production, harvesting, packing, 
But the major is issue is for clean. First of all, clean soil. We say safe soil, clean water, clean surfaces and clean hands. Safe soil, mainly we talk about the manure. You can you not use a fresh manure to do the planting or harvesting. You cannot do that. Manure has to be at least uh, older than 24 hours. Clean water, no coliforms, zero tolerance for coliforms, which is under generic E. coli, which is indicated fecal contamination. Clean surfaces, which means the physical removing with chemical antimicrobials. Basically here, we're talking about biofilms control. So you have to do a good job of the clean surfaces. Clean hands, typically right now with COVID-19, that's clean hands is more important. So at least 25 seconds cleaning using soap and water, how are you gonna make sure the 25 seconds is reached? Uh, make sure you sing a song with happy birthday during that period of time. So you can make sure it's 25 seconds. So this is some of the surveillance and the regulation in the United States. So just give you a brief idea. So surveillance can, uh, taken care of by CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They have a food net puzzle net based on the PFGE. They have the three bands, uh, three bands matching principles, and they could be uh, to see the to see the passage and whether in their database. For example, you have a listeria mouse autogenous isolated from the foods. They can see their database, whether it matches their database, which strings, which species is that. Now regulations, basically we talk about the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the USDA, FSIS, for the safety, for the safety and in inspection service. FDA is for domestic imported food, and the FSIS is for meat, processed egg, and the poultry. So be careful, raw egg is for FDA. So the tricky thing is that if you have a hamburger, then the egg between the hamburger, that's a processed egg, is belonging to the regulation of USDA FSIS. If you have a raw egg, that's belonging to the FDA. So just let you know. Now, right now, there is a tendency. FDA started to taking care of everything besides meat and egg and the poultry processed egg and the poultry products. So next, I want to just give you an example of what we did for our local at West Virginia, we do some of the research, but we also do some of the extension. It's a combination of integrated research and, and extension activity. So this is a talk about of our local fresh produce safety. Uh, we talk about uh, sweep step wash. We try to control the pathogen during squash surfaces. So first of all, in our we do a survey in our local community, about like 20 small uh, processes. There is two methods of the three-step uh, three wash they did. Number one, water rinse, antimicrobial dip, and the water rinse. Number two is water rinse, water rinse, and antimicrobial dip. So we want to see which one is better. And first of all, we told them, there is about five processes. They do antimicrobial dip, water rinse, and the water rinse. We told them you should never do that because the soil dust on the produce surfaces will neutralize antimicrobials of first step, especially chlorine. So effective concentration of the free chlorine will be decreased to almost zero if you use soil and the dust on the surfaces. So for example, 200 p parts per million could be decreased to about 0 0.5 in like 30 seconds. So make sure that fresh produce surface is cleaned. So you cannot use antimicrobial dip first. What are the sanitizers we are doing? Uh, we have two are very normal, which is Chickside. Uh, the Chickside, which is a, um, is, is a blend of lactic acid, citric acid. Then we use chlorine. Lots of people using chlorine. Uh, effective concentration, 200 parts per million. But the most of the local processors, they are interested about the sanitate, sanitate 5.0, which is a mixture of water, unknown components, and uh, Perioxyacetic acids with hydrogen peroxide. So we try to see just different three different two different three step wash methods from West Virginia local tomato spinach in the Morgantown farmers markets. What the effects for that? So let's introduce you a little bit for chlorine. Chlorine one bottle five dollar. Now I want to say they pay much attention to the dollar because it's expensive if they use. Too expensive antimicrobials did not get a good control. They will be very mad for the local small processors. They use 100 ppm parts per million, up to 200 parts per million. 
Chlorine is very e effective in the pure solution, which means no any dust, no any organic matter. They can cure five log bacteria, 99.99% in five seconds, but it's very sensitive to soil, dust, and debris. Check side, which is also, we call it a veggie side. That is expensive, more than $100 for five gallon pail. Effective concentration, 2.5%. It is a lactic acid, citric acid, the blender prevent decoloration. So first they use on the poultry meats, they use lactic acid or citric acid. They find that they will cause decoloration of the uh, poultry meat. So they started to think about, we do a mixer that maybe pre uh, solve the problem. And then they think about the chick side that can be effective on the chicken. How about the vegetables? So they change the label, become a veggie side. So we do some of the validation for that. Now, sandy date, sandy date 5.0, that's a very expensive one. Okay, that's $311, five gallon pail. It's a mixture of perioxys acetic acid and H2O2. They want to use it because it's approved for the organic produce surfaces. So what we did, now this is something different from research and extension. For the extension, we do the research but when we write a fact sheet, we usually be very briefly. We don't write very details. So we say we do using water dip, antimicrobial dip, water dip. So it does reduce the salmonella, listeria, mosatogenes on surface. But water dip, water dip, and antimicrobial dip should be used. And the results indicate 0.25% sanitate, 2.5% veggie size solutions will be effective for both pathogen or tomato and spinach surfaces. And the both are better alternatives for the chlorine water. Now chlorine water in the local level, they don't really like it. Lots of people think it's inorganic and it's not gonna be certified. So they're not introduced, interested about that one at all. So then we did some lab work. We did a plant on-site validation study. This is in the Preston County workshop in Reedsville, West Virginia. Uh, it's a snowing day. We went there. We do the squash. Uh, we do the three steps washing their real plants. Including the first step, use, use the brush to take out of the dust. The second one, we use mob uh, to, um, to wash the surface. And we dip in into the sandy day solutions use a metal rack, okay? And then we do the storage and the person there is helping us. And then we put into the um, storage room, keep at 48.2 degree Fahrenheit. And uh, we do the shelf life study because no pathogen for the, no pathogen really for those, for those, uh, um, so those plants. So we do every seven days until 70 days, we testing Arabic plate counts, E. coli, coliform, fungi, lactic acid, bacteria, and the cyclophiles, which means bacteria growing in the refrigerator temperature. So here is our con conclusion. So we don't need to show them the results. Uh, we have the results, we get the publication, but we need to tell them what we find. So we find that the sandy is 5.0, 0.0071%, 0.45%, 0 0.45%. They wash the squash will significantly decrease the total bacterial population, coliform, lactic acid, bacteria, and the cyclotrophs compared to the unwashed and the, and the control. Typically for the day, 50 to 70. However, we did not find there's a difference between these two concentrations. So which means in the plant level, in the real level, does not mean the higher concentration will solve the problem. It's the same as those minimal concentration. Well, part of the reason is because the situation is real life is different from the lab. So lots of things we cannot control. So it's very interesting to see you adding more sandy data does not mean you will have more effects. And that's important because sandy data 5.0 is very expensive. That gallon is five gallon, um, bottle is $300. Now for them, very important, what is the cost? So we working with the um, agriculture economist and then we do some of the calculation. We find the estimated annual operation cost of triple wash for sandy date is ranged from 487 to $1,977 for growers. They produce 1,000 to 5,000 squashes. And that number is important because they need to know the, the money, what they're gonna cost.
Okay, so that study is actually funded by the USDA NIFA, uh, which is from the Critical Agriculture Research and Extension Program. And also we get it funding from the Risk Management Agency from USDA under our extension service. So this is a research and extension integrated activity. They require you to must have extension components there, not only the research, which means the results will be have to be published in layman language, most of them in the fact sheets or at our WVU extension service website. Okay, so this is end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Hope you have a good semester.